Hi everybody, my name is Danny and I'm part of the worship team at Valley Life North Mountain. Here at Valley Life, we want to be known as a church that prays. So every week we get together to intentionally pray. We also know that at Valley Life, it's someone's first time visiting us. So we want to make this as comfortable as possible. All the prompts will be on the screen. So gather together as a family and let's pray. Take a moment and thank God for the doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers who are on the front line of the COVID pandemic. Ask God to protect them as they bravely face this disease on a daily basis. Pray for God to keep us on mission and to give us opportunities to share the gospel with friends this week. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And Father, we just come before you right now, and we just thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that we learn something valuable from this. We also pray over all those who are going through the different motions of this pandemic. Be with our churches, be with our pastors, be with the physicians. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Well, good morning, Valley Life Church. My name is Mike Lee, and I get to be the pastor here at Valley Life North Mountain. I want to welcome you today to church. I'm so glad that you're here, and I really much look, I very much look forward to hearing from you today in the chat on our website or in the comments on Facebook. And so speaking of that, let's just get it going right now. Let's just jump in there and get it going. Let's try something out right now in the chat. Maybe this will be fun, um, and so I'd like to just do it. So what have you been doing for fun for the last couple of months? Just type it in there in the chat, type it in the comment section. What have you been doing for fun during this time of social distancing and all that kind of stuff? What kind of things have you been doing? And I gotta be honest with you, I'm doing two things right here. Obviously one of them is I'm trying to engage you in the chat, but the other one, if I'm being completely honest with you, is that I am trying to steal ideas from you. See, my family's been trying to find new ways to occupy the extra time that we have home right now. And so we're just looking for new ideas and so I'm gonna steal some of yours. So we've been doing a lot of things as a family. We've been playing some card games. I, I talked a little bit about that last week and the way that Courtney uh, cheats at that all the time. We've been playing board games. Uh, we actually played Monopoly together and something crazy happened during this time of social distancing, something that's never happened, I don't think, in the existence of my family. We actually finished a game of Monopoly and everybody still talked afterwards. And so that was fantastic. Uh, we've also been reading, we've been going for walks around the neighborhood and we've been watching some movies together. And so in the last couple of weeks, the kids have really gotten into this idea of watching movie series, like not just one movie, but movies that have multiple series to them. So like they wanted to watch The Lord of the Rings, and so they, they watched that whole trilogy, and then they wanted to watch The Hobbit, and then they watched that whole trilogy, and they're considering now watching through all of the Marvel movies. And I would think at first, like, geez, that seems like it's gonna take forever, but it seems like these days we do have a lot of extra time. And so just last week, we were watching something. We were watching one of these movie series and we came to the end of one movie and then Courtney wanted to start the next one. But it was kind of late at night. And so I said, hey, honey, it's, it's a little bit too late. Why don't we wait? We'll watch that one tomorrow or, or the next day or something like that. And she said, hey, I cannot wait till the next day. I got to know what's going on. I can't be waiting around till tomorrow. I got I to gotta see what happens next. And then James, uh, he perks up and he's like, hey, wait a second, what are you talking about wait till tomorrow? He said, are you kidding me? He said, when this movie came out in the theaters, I had to wait almost an entire year to see the sequel. And so then I was like, a year, that's nothing. 
So I guess I'm officially now one of those dads who every time their kids talk about a hardship that they went through, I have to tell them how I went through something harder. I, I was honestly planning on never being one of those dads, but I guess it happened sometime when I wasn't paying attention. So I was like, you guys don't even know what waiting is. You don't even know what it's like to have to wait for sequels. Do you have any idea how long we had to wait all the way back in the 80s between Back to the Future 1 and Back to the Future Part 2? You see, they had no idea. You see, Back to the Future Part 1 came out in 1985. It was a movie about a scientist who invented a time machine, which, by the way, would be fantastic now. Wouldn't it be great to have a time machine and fast forward through some stuff or maybe go backwards into some stuff? And I also would tell you that it's pretty clear to me that people must never invent a time machine because if there was ever a time to come back to and undo some stuff, it would be 2020. But anyways, it's got nothing to do with the sermon. I just think it would be fantastic if somebody from the future could come back. Anyways, this movie was a pretty good movie. Back to the Future is a pretty good movie. But then it ends with a cliffhanger. It, the movie ends by creating a brand new problem that you'll have to wait until the sequel for it to get solved. And so at the end of the movie, up on the screen, it just flashed to be continued. And so all of us 80s kids, we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited. And finally, in 1989, Back to the Future 2 finally comes out four years later. We waited around four years for the sequel. And then the sequel had the nerve to end with to be continued. And nobody cared about that third movie. Everybody was sick of waiting. And I got to tell you, in some ways, it feels like that's what it's been like waiting to hear more about this guy, Melchizedek. We've been studying through the book of Hebrews and the author introduced us to this guy Melchizedek way back in chapter five. And now we've been waiting. The, the, the author, he kind of teased us. He said, here's this guy Melchizedek. And he says, I have so much more to tell you about this guy and his relationship with Jesus. But before I get into it, I got to tell you all this other stuff. And that was all of chapter six. And so we were waiting and we were waiting and he kind of teased us a little bit and we were waiting and waiting. And now finally in chapter seven, as we get into Hebrews today in chapter seven, we will finally get to learn everything we ever wanted to know about Melchizedek. Well, well, that may or may not be true. You see, I don't actually know what you want to know about Melchizedek. Maybe you don't, know, don't want to know anything more about Melchizedek. Maybe you're tired of trying to pronounce the guy's name in community groups, and so you have no desire to hear anything more about him. But maybe you want to know a lot more about him. So I guess all I can really promise you is that today we will cover everything we can know about Melchizedek from Scripture. You see, Melchizedek is only mentioned a couple of times in the entire Bible. If you were to read this entire Bible cover to cover, you would really only see Melchizedek mentioned a couple of times. He's mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, way at the beginning of the Bible. And then he's mentioned again in the, in the Psalms, in Psalm 110, when David writes a song about him. And then he's mentioned here in Hebrews by, our, by the author that we're studying right, right now in Hebrews. And the thing that I want to accomplish today the thing that I want to get through to you, the thing that's really kind of my big idea for this sermon, and the thing that I hope you remember after this day is over, is that Melchizedek is a big deal. But Jesus is so much bigger. Melchizedek is a big deal, but Jesus is so much bigger. Today is week three of our series, Convinced of Better Things. And the thing that I want you to be convinced of today, the better thing that I want you to be convinced of today is that Melchizedek is a big deal, but Jesus is so much better. You know how sometimes you need to compare something to something else to see how big it is or how good it is? Like when you compare something to something else, you can see like how big it is or how much better it is. For example, when we look at the sun or when we think about our sun, the sun that, that we revolve around, the sun is really big and it's really awesome and it's really fantastic unless you compare it to Arcturus. You see, it turns out that the star Arcturus is 26 times bigger than our sun. But by knowing that the sun is big, it helps us understand how huge Arcturus is. Or like if you think about the Empire State Building. See, the Empire State Building is really big. It's, it's really, really tall. It comes in at 1,453 feet, and that is very, very tall. 
until you compare it to the Burj Khafia in Dubai, which comes in at 2,723 feet. And if we could just grasp how big the Empire State Building is, we have a better understanding of just how awesome that tower in Dubai is. And of course, my favorite comparison, I've been using it a lot since the last dance came on, is the comparison of LeBron James and Michael Jordan. You see, LeBron James is an unbelievable basketball player by any standard until you compare him to Michael Jordan. And when we observe LeBron's greatness, it helps us appreciate just how unreal Michael was. I mean, LeBron is fantastic, but next to Michael Jordan, he's just second base. And so in our text today, the author of Hebrews wants us to first understand what a huge deal Melchizedek is so that we can better understand just how amazing Jesus is. And so with that, let's get into the text. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 7. We are going to go through this entire text today. There's a lot of it, so let's get to it. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 2, talking about how awesome Melchizedek is. These first 10 verses just really talk about how amazing Melchizedek Melchizedek is. It says here, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything he is. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem. That is king of peace. Now, there's lots of big deals here. There's a lot to say about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a king of Salem, and he was a priest of the Most High God, and this is a big deal. You see, Melchizedek is a priest king. He's not just a priest, and he's not just a king. He's a priest king. You know, we might study the kings that we find in the Old Testament. We see that David was a king. He was a king after God's own heart, but he was not a priest. We also know that Aaron, maybe we're studying along, we see Aaron. Aaron is the first priest in the Levitical line, but he is not a king. But here we have this guy Melchizedek, and he is a priest king. So it's a really big deal. And the text goes on in verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 3. It says, He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. This also is a very big deal. This is a big deal that Melchizedek's genealogy is not mentioned. We don't have his genealogy. We we can read all throughout the Bible and we will find other people whose genealogy we do have. You see, we totally know David's genealogy. We know Solomon, his son. We know David's son, Solomon. We know his genealogy. And we certainly have Jesus's genealogy. If you want to know where Jesus came from, if you want to know where how to trace his ancestors back, you could open up to Matthew and you could read his entire genealogy and trace him all the way back. But the author here does not tell us of Melchizedek's genealogy. He tells us neither who Melchizedek's parents were or whether or not Melchizedek had any children. Now, clearly Melchizedek had parents. He didn't just appear. We just don't know who they are. And the author does this deliberately to establish that Melchizedek, this king priest Melchizedek, is a foreshadow of Jesus who is without beginning or end, who is in fact forever. Melchizedek is this foreshadow of Jesus. He is symbolic of Jesus who will come. And so the text goes on in verses 4 through 10. It says, See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is from their brothers. Through these also they are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descendant from descendant from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestors when Melchizedek met him. And so Abraham, who is God's chosen man, 
the one God is going to make a people of himself through, meets Melchizedek, and Abraham gives Melchizedek a tenth of his wealth. Now, this is a really huge deal. This will establish the tithe of 10%, which will later be collected by priests and eventually collected even in churches like ours. And yet he is greater than any priest that came from the Levitical priesthood and was in fact a priest well before Aaron was even born. There's this line in there that says he was a priest long before Aaron was even in his ancestors' loins. And my buddy Jason over at Valley Life Surprise gets a kick out of it, that, that line. He always finds these lines in scripture that he, that he kind of chuckles about and he shares that with us. But what we see in these first 10 verses is that Melchizedek is a really big deal. He's a really, really big deal. And so have you ever been like, have you ever watched like scene or watched like a boxing match or maybe an MM fight, MMA MMA fight, and they do that tail of the tape? You know, they'll list the stats of the fighters, maybe put them side by side. There's sort of like this tail of the tape. And so maybe you've seen that in a boxing match or MMA. And so Melchizedek's tail of the tape would say something like, kingship, boom, king of Salem. Priesthood, boom, priest of the most high God. Parents, unknown. Children, unknown. Greater than the Levitical priesthood, worthy of a 10% offering from the patriarch Abraham, foreshadow of Jesus Christ. This would have been a pretty impressive tale of the tape. And so Melchizedek is a really big deal. And the author of Hebrews desperately wants us to get this so that we can understand and appreciate better just how amazing Jesus is. Now remember that this entire book, the entire book of Hebrews, could be summed up by simply saying Jesus is greater than anything. And so, of course, Jesus is better than anyone, but with the framework of just how important Melchizedek is. With that framework, then we can better appreciate how big of a deal Jesus is. And really, the big deal made here in chapter 7 of Hebrews is that Jesus is a far superior priest even than Melchizedek. Jesus is a far superior priest. Now you'll probably remember that we've already covered our need for a priest. You and I desperately need a priest. We are in desperate need of a priest. That was our last series that we went through called Between God and Us. And we talked about our need for a priest. We said that a priest stands between God and his people. We said that God is holy and perfect and people are sinners. And as sinners, we cannot stand before a perfect and holy God. We need someone to intercede for us. And Jesus is that one that stands between us and God. And so the rest of this chapter of Hebrews, the rest of what he's going to write here in chapter 7, tells us what kind of priest Jesus is. He's going to tell us what kind of priest Jesus is, and that one is one that is far superior even to Melchizedek. And so the author is going to make six points about Jesus' priesthood, and the first one is this, Jesus is the perfect priest. Jesus is the perfect priest. If there is a perfect priest, it's Jesus. What kind of priest is Jesus? Well, he's the perfect kind. Hebrews 7, 11 through 12 says, Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So you see, this was the entire other priesthood. It had come from the line of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. You remember that God had called Moses to free his people from Pharaoh and bring them all out of Egypt. And God called the Aaron to be their priest and to be the go-between between God and his people. And that line of priests, that line of priests that came from Aaron was the Levitical line of priests. And some of those priests were really good and some of those priests really bad. Uh, Some of them were probably somewhere in between, but none of those priests was perfect. The thing that you should know about that Levitical line is that none of those guys was perfect. The author here in Hebrew says, if it was possible for a perfect priest to come through the Levitical line, it would have happened. But it's not possible 
So what we need is a priest from the order of Melchizedek. What we really need is a perfect priest. And I want you to know today that Jesus is that perfect priest. He is perfect in every way. Jesus is without blemish. Jesus never, ever sinned. Not one cross word, not one dirty look, not one selfish motive. Jesus is the perfect priest. But he's more than that as priest. Not only is he perfect, but Jesus is the royal priest. Jesus is the royal priest. The author goes on in verse 13 through 14. He says, For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And so again, some Old Testament background, the Jewish people formed different tribes and different lines came from those tribes. Aaron, Aaron, as we've talked about, was a priest and that line was the Levitical line and the royal line came from Judah. And if you were to open up the Gospel of Matthew, like I talked about just a minute ago, and trace Jesus's lineage back, you would see, if you could read back, you can read that Jesus would come from the line of Judah. Je Jesus came from that line. Jesus' earthly father was Joseph, Joseph the carpenter that married Mary, and, and, and they went to Bethlehem and had Jesus, that, that same Joseph. If you were to go backwards in Joseph's line and go great, 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 great grandpa, grandpa far enough, you would get to Judah, which is the royal line. And so this means that like Melchizedek, Jesus is a king priest. But he is superior to Melchizedek, Melchizedek because he is the perfect king priest. I want you to know today that Jesus is the perfect king priest. And if that's all he was, it'd be fantastic, but it goes on. See, Jesus is also the eternal priest. This is the third thing in Jesus' tale of the tape. Jesus is the eternal priest. Hebrews 7, 15 through 17 says, This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, one of the things that was awesome about Melchizedek is that he didn't get the job because of what family he came from. Heck, we don't even know what family he's from. He simply was chosen for the job. All those priests that came throughout the Levitical line got the job in part because they were from the right family. But like Melchizedek, Jesus was appointed for the job by God himself. And so also like Melchizedek, Jesus is a priest forever. There is no end to Jesus' time as priest. He is eternal. Jesus isn't going anywhere. He is going to be priest forever. And so I would tell you today that Jesus is the perfect eternal king priest. But there's even more than that. See, the other thing I would tell you is that Jesus is the priest of the new covenant. Jesus is the priest of the new covenant. This is the next thing in Jesus' tale of the tape. He is the priest of the new covenant. Hebrews 7, 18 through 22 reads, For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a perfect hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So there was this old covenant there was an old law of the Old Testament, and when people violated that law, it was sin. And when sin occurred, an atonement for sin had to happen. An atonement had to take place. And as we've said before, this was done with a blood sacrifice. And the high priest would carry out that sin offering. And so as we've said before, people would symbolically come and put their sin on an animal, and that animal was killed and sacrificed. 
And this might seem like an odd thing to do. It maybe seems like an odd thing, but if you stop and think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense because it is a reminder that sin always leads to death. I don't care what sin we're talking about. As a church, you should know by now, because we've said it a lot, that sin will always lead to death. Sin will always lead to the death of something. Sometimes sin will lead to the death of trust. Sometimes sin will lead to the death of a relationship. Sometimes sin will lead to the death of innocence. But sin will always lead to a death. And so here, it is a reminder that sin leads to death. And the thing that died when people sinned during the time of the Old Testament was these animals. It's also a reminder that sin will always cost something. And so when people of the Old Testament sinned, they would make the sacrifice and it would literally cost them an animal. It would cost them something. Their sin would cost them something. Anyways, this sacrificial system pointed out that sin always leads to death and it also pointed out that sin will cost something and so this all happened under that law and under that covenant but the thing is that law and that covenant was powerless to stop sin it simply pointed it out it was powerless to stop sin it it just pointed it out it's like hey you sinned again you sinned and, and, and it's just pointing it out but then Jesus comes And now there is a new covenant, and Jesus is the priest of that covenant. You see, Jesus is the perfect, eternal king priest of the new covenant. Jesus is the perfect, eternal king priest of this new covenant. But there's even more than that. The fifth thing on Jesus' tale of the tape, talking about his priesthood, would say that Jesus is the permanent priest. Jesus is the permanent priest. Verse 22 through 25 says, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he who holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever, consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, there were a bunch of priests between the time of Aaron and the time of Jesus. And the reason that there were so many is because these priests didn't live forever. They would get old and they would die and then there would need to be a new priest that would come along. Now, I don't know exactly how many there were, but there's about 1,500 years between Aaron being appointed priest and when Jesus came. And so that's a lot of guys. That's a lot of priests. But Jesus is a permanent priest. See, there is no other priest that ever needs to come and take the office because Jesus is permanent. Jesus is simply not going anywhere. That makes Jesus the perfect, permanent, eternal king priest of this new covenant but more than that jesus is the sacrificed priest jesus is the sacrificed priest hebrews 7 26 through 28 says for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest holy innocent unstained separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sin and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. You see, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And Jesus doesn't need to make multiple sacrifices like all those other priests did. They made many sacrifices, but because Jesus' sacrifice is perfect, he doesn't need to make any sacrifices. See, when Jesus was arrested, when he was beaten and mocked and spit upon and made to wear a crown of thorns. When Jesus was forced to carry his cross up a hill only to be nailed to it, when he bore all the sins of the world, when for the first time in history, Jesus was separated from God, and when Jesus breathed out his last breath and died on that cross, Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. 
See, Jesus did not just make the perfect sacrifice. Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. And so when we ask what kind of priest Jesus was, we would say that Jesus is the perfect, permanent, eternal king priest of the new covenant who became the perfect sacrifice. And so I guess the question is, do you need a priest like that? I guess the question before us is, do you need a priest like that? You see, Hebrews is quite clear. As far as priests go, Jesus is the goat. Jesus is perfect in every way. There is no one to compare him to. He is far superior than anybody that came from the Levitical line. And he is even far superior to Melchizedek himself. Jesus is the perfect priest. He is the perfect priest to stand between imperfect sinners and a perfect God. He is perfect to stand between imperfect sinners and a very perfect God. And make no mistake about it, you and I are sinners. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not some have sinned, not most will sin, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. We are all sinners. And one day we will all have to stand before a perfect God. Romans 14, 11 through 12 tells us, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow down to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. You see, we are all sinners, and we will all stand before a perfect God. Those two things are truths of which we have no choice. We are Sinners, even if you haven't realized that you could look at your life and see sin all over it, we are sinners and one day we will have to stand before a perfect God. You see, but what you do have a choice about is whether or not you want Jesus to stand between you and God. You see, you can stand before God on your own. You could stand before God and face all of his condemnation for all the sins of your life, which would be awful. Just picture yourself standing before a perfect God and he looks down on you and sees all the sins. He sees all the times that you were selfish. He sees all the times that you put yourself above others. He sees all the times that you broke his laws and he knows about all of them. He knows about the sins that you put on full display for everybody. And he knows about the sins that are buried deep in your heart. And so your choice is that you can stand before that God on your own. Or you can stand before God with Jesus right in between you. You have the choice to have Jesus say, I, I've got you. You stand here and God will look at me. God will look at me and he will see what I've done and he will credit you for it. God won't see all the things that you've done. God will see what I've done. You see, we have the choice to stand before a perfect God with Jesus, the perfect, permanent, eternal king priest of the new covenant who became the perfect sacrifice between us and that perfect God. You know, if you've never believed in Jesus, you could do that today. Today could be the day where you would say, I am not going to stand before God on my own. I, I've been living like I would do that, but I, I don't want to do that anymore. It seems like a bad idea to me. Today is the day you could do that right where you're at. Because the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You could believe that today. You could become a Christian today. You could approach God with confidence, with the confidence that only comes with a perfect priest between you and him. You could do that today. And so the question that I have with you, church, the question that I have if you are watching this sermon or listening to this podcast is can you believe today? Can you believe today? Can you give up any belief that says that you can do this on your own? And can you simply believe in Jesus? See, he is perfect and he will save you. 
if you can believe. Let's pray. Lord God, it is, it is so hard to fathom how perfect you are, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your perfection. Lord, we thank you that you stand between us and God, that we uh, can be convinced of that, Lord. We, th we thank you for that. And Lord God, if there are people that are watching this sermon or listening to this podcast who have never believed in you, Lord God, I ask that you would give them the faith to believe today. Lord, I ask you to save my friends that they could approach God with the confidence that only comes when you are accompanied by the perfect priest, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. And so today, uh, like I do every week when we preach, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what you just heard. We don't primarily preach this stuff to teach information. We preach this stuff so that it can have an impact on your heart, so that through God's word, your heart can be transformed. And so I want to give you an opportunity to respond today. And here are a couple of responses. The first is this, if you are a Christian, I would invite you to respond in the confidence that allows you to approach a perfect God because of Jesus. I invite you to give up anything else that you look to, to do that which only Jesus can. And I mostly invite you to respond in joy. I invite you to respond with joy today, with the joy that you know the perfect priest and that he is interceding between you and God even now. And I invite you to respond in joyful worship. When you join Justine in the band and sing, I invite you to respond in joyful giving as you generously continue to give to this church as we reach out and meet the needs of our community. And I invite you to respond in joy by taking the Lord's Supper to take the bread and the juice that represents Jesus's body and blood spilled for you. And I invite you to take it joyfully, remembering what Jesus did to make it possible for you to approach God with confidence. And if you're not a Christian and you want to become one, I invite you to respond by becoming a Christian today. Just allow Jesus to stand between you and God. You could do that right now. You could do that right where you're at, in your living room, in your car. Maybe you're listening to this podcast and driving down the 51. I don't know where you're at, but you could pray right now, wherever you're at and whatever time it is, you could say, Jesus, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I believe in your life, death, and resurrection, and I need you to save me because I simply cannot save myself. If you did that, or would like to talk to somebody about doing that, would you just text BELIEVE to the number on the bottom of your screen? There is literally nothing I would rather do today than call you and celebrate with you that you're a Christian or talk to you about what it would like for you to become a Christian. And here is the third response that I have for you. If you're not a Christian and you're just not quite ready to become one, I would invite you to respond by coming back would you just come back? Would you come back here next Sunday? Will you keep trying this on? Would you just keep coming back to this church and allow this church to pray for you and care for you until you're ready? Valley Life, I love you so much and I cannot wait until I can see you again. Have a great week and I look forward to connecting you with you in the chat. Love you guys.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart.
Too late, there's no too far. You're calling.